man, chip watch. It's real talk. Man, it's real talk with your main chip Washington. When it comes to information, the man got an arsenal. Bring you up to speed with what you need. He's a local and nationwide news feed. Let's talk about it. Dialect to do something about it. Chip got the flow wide open if you got questions about it. Man, it's the show that brings you to your raw. To solve all problems, it starts with real talk. It's real talk. And here we go, here we go on this Monday evening, the 22nd of August, 2021. Welcome to Real Talk Memphis. I am your humble host, Chip Washington. Very happy to have you with us on this evening. And of course, uh, uh, the gang's all here tonight, so we're all feeling good. It's hot. It's hot outside, man. You got It's been like the heat index is like about 103, 104, 105 today. So if you're going to be hanging around outside... You need to stay hydrated. You need to drink plenty of fluids, and you know, or just or just like stay inside. That might be a good alternative to all this as well. So, I hope you have had a good week since the last uh, time we uh, were able to chat with you, each other about seven days ago. Uh, time goes fast, doesn't it? The weekend uh, went by so fast. The weekend was about twenty-five minutes for me. I don't know about you, but it was it went by very, very quickly, and. Uh, before we get into the show, like we always do, you might be asking yourself, self, how do I get into this fine piece of radio broadcasting? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'll get you through it. You can check us out um, a few ways. You can right now live on the radio, 91.7 WYXR, or you can go to the website, WYXR.org, hit the listen live button, and there we are. You can also go to the tune in app, put in WYXR in the search. And you can hear us crystal clearly. And we are on Facebook Live tonight. So uh, if you are, uh, you know, in the vicinity of all of that and, uh, you know, you want to check us out for a few minutes, I'd appreciate it. Say hello. I'm saying hello to you all right now, uh, wherever you are. Hello. Good to see you. (laughs) So uh, it has been uh, a long day today, and we have uh, a lot to talk about. We have some uh, good guests tonight, as a matter of fact. A little bit of variety, but we're going to talk about some... uh, Pretty substantial issues that you need to know. So hopefully you'll stick with us uh, for the hour because we have some good guests to be with you tonight. Southern Heritage Classic is coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, That was one of the biggest premier events in town. Uh, We're going to have some more on that next week. Uh, Actually, Fred Jones is going to be here uh, on the join us on the show next week. And one of the coaches from uh, the Tennessee State University Tigers. His name is Eddie George. He'll be with us next week as well. But as we always like to do, we like to acknowledge you. We like to acknowledge your special day. If you had a birthday over the weekend, Jack, hit it. Happy birthday! Yeah. I'm just gonna let you hear this for just a second. It's doula. Yeah. Happy, happy birthday. Now, to those of you who had birthdays, you celebrated over the weekend. Happy belated birthday. One person I know had a birthday over the weekend is sitting in this studio right now. Adam turned 19 years old on Saturday. Happy belated birthday, sir. Look at him. He's just sitting there. He's laid back. Adam is so cool. (laughs) But happy birthday to you. Uh, Also, uh, celebrating birthdays today, Jerry Cummings. Happy birthday to you. Sonia Jones. It's your birthday. Happy birthday, Brett Boric. Happy birthday to Brenda Boylan Kyles, uh, to Wynema Sanders, Mike Hamlet. I know Mike Hamlet. I used to work with him back in the old T 
TV days. And someone who always supports my post and who always seems to support the show and what we're trying to do here. Happy belated birthday this past Saturday to Linda Harris. So, Linda, happy belated birthday to you and to all of you out there. Happy birthday. I hope you had a good time celebrating. And if you haven't done it yet, the night is still young. Okay, man. Thank you. So, um, as we move forward into the news and notes uh, category, there is uh, a few things to talk about. Of course, many of you may have heard that the FDA granted full approval for the Pfizer vaccine today, which means it's no longer emergency use authorization, but it is fully approved. So, the question now is, for the people who have yet to get vaccinated, will this make a difference? Will this urge you now that you know to go and now get a vac- vaccine shot because it's it's fully authorized now, i don't know we'll have to wait and see about that numbers maybe maybe 10 percent, maybe 15 percent, maybe that's that sways that crowd but i'm not necessarily sure but we will as we say see now if you're in mississippi first of all if you heard anything about mississippi and their cases blowing up off the charts they said new daily records every single day for covid exposure and positive cases, they have uh, gotten to the point where they said if you test positive and if you do not isolate yourself for the 10 days that it is required, they will fine you up to $500 and they could lock you up for five years. That is what they said. Now, I don't, <laughs> I, I don't think that's going to be the case. But if you are positive and you're not isolating, they're getting pretty dramatic with what they are going to do to you. So you might want to think two or three times before you go out and breathe on other folks, because in case you didn't know, this is a very contagious and airborne uh, virus we're dealing with. Hundreds of cases in every school district, not only in Mississippi, but uh, in, the, in the county of Shelby as well. First day, I think we're two, day, we're two, we're two weeks in now, and... Um, as of today, Shelby County Schools reports 275 students and staff have tested positive for COVID-19. And again, we've only been in school for two weeks. The nationwide average of cases per seven days is 140,000. And now we're back up to 1,000 deaths a day per seven-day average. And I don't know if uh, many of you heard or any of you heard that Reverend Jesse Jackson and his wife are now in the hospital. They are hospitalized in Chicago uh, t- after testing positive for COVID, so uh, prayers up to uh, both of them. The Tennessee Titans football coach, Mike Vrabel, uh, disclosed that he has tested positive for COVID as well. So, you know, for all those who, uh, you know, are dealing with this right now, um, you know, it, I know it's a tough thing. I, I know it is, and I pray every day that I don't contract it or no one that's close to me does as well. So, uh, but, uh, you know, we're going to pray for all the folks who are dealing with this uh, very dangerous variant. And uh, hopefully uh, one day the unvaccinated will realize that vaccination really is something that we all need to do. And we're going to talk about that. As a matter of fact, uh, I wanted to get a ground bird's eye view, a level street view of exactly what goes on in the emergency rooms. Many of us have heard from coast to coast that emergency rooms are completely uh, you know, overbooked. People are waiting for days, you know, in the emergency pods before they can even be seen. Uh, there's so much sickness. There's so many people that are looking for treatment. We're going to talk to an ED nurse in just a few minutes to give you, uh, you know, a close-up look at what this is all about. Uh, let's see here. Oh, uh, over the weekend, uh, and again, prayers up to the folks in uh, Middle Tennessee. 21 people were dead from flash flooding that occurred there a couple of days ago. 17 inches of rain fell uh, over the weekend in Humphreys County, which is just a few miles west of Nashville. So, And if you've seen it on the news, oh, my God, it looks like a disaster area. Water is a very powerful force, and it can take everything in its, in its wake and in its path. So it's going to be a long recovery for those folks. And... Uh, did anybody see the concert over the weekend? There was a big New York City, I Love New York concert that went on in Central Park. And, of course, it was supposed to be four hours, but I think somewhere around two and a half, uh, that uh, tropical storm, Henri, blew through there. And uh, once it started to rain, 
it never stopped raining. So the acts that didn't get on, uh, maybe they'll try to reschedule it for another day. I know Bruce Springsteen didn't perform. The Killers didn't perform. Uh, Paul Simon didn't. Uh, so there were several folks who were still left uh, to come on stage. But I liked LL Cool J and all the boys of, uh, you know, rap and things like that. What? I can like rap. It's all, I mean, they, 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 those rappers were like in my generation. They came up. You know, I remember LL Cool J. They say he's the GOAT. Lola, is LL Cool J the GOAT of rapping? Kind of sort of? Yeah, he is a legend. Yeah, he is a legend. Yeah, I'm a legend in my own mind. So, but but I'm a legend too. But in any, <laughs> that was a that was a good show. And finally, uh, welcome back, University of Memphis, back on campus today. Now, yeah, they have a mask mandate. Any any indoors classes, anytime you go indoor inside a building, you have to wear your mask. And I'm going to tell you what you're going to see. You may not see a whole lot of people get vaccinated behind this, uh, this approval today of Pfizer. But what you're going to start to see are more companies issuing vaccine mandates. I mean, now that they have, you know, the backing of this behind them, watch and see how that pops up. Watch and see how schools do it. More businesses do it. So that's going to be an interesting process as we move forward. But, yes, another school year. A back to school for the University of Memphis uh, students, and I'm sure many students are around the, the country uh, are as well. They are all heading back to the classroom. We wish them health. We wish them good health, and we also wish them good grades. But, you know, we're dealing with young people, so we'll see how all this shakes out. Okay, that's enough for news and notes. We are going to take our first break, and when we come back, We're going to get into the show and talk a little bit about what goes on in an emergency room setting uh, with someone who can uh, speak to that very well. This is Real Talk Memphis. I am your humble host, Chip Washington. Very glad to have you with us on this Monday night. We will be right back. You're listening to Real Talk with Chip Washington. If you're celebrating a birthday, anniversary, or special occasion, shoot him a note and he'll read it on the air. Get involved and tell somebody about Real Talk. We'll be right back. Every Saturday I go to Fist City, but every Sunday morning I hang out with Brandy Rinks for her putting on airs, country, honky tonk, folk. She's the best, y'all. Tune in every Sunday from 9 to 10 a.m. There's really nothing better than a box of records. Not even a bottle of beer. Things are gone in a matter of minutes, but final just won't disappear. Hi there, this is Zach Ives. My show, A Box of Records, plays every Tuesday night, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., right here on WYXR 91.7 FM, Memphis, Tennessee. What you got in your record box? Bring it along to the Memphis Listening Lab and WYXR's inaugural Record Swap and Zine Fest, presented in association with Crosstown Arts. Vendors will be lining the halls of the Crosstown Concourse with rare musical finds and deep, engaging, independently published magazines. Hear live sets from WYXR DJs spitting the best from their final collections. The event starts at 10 a.m. Saturday, September 4th and Sunday, September 5th. For customer and vendor information, visit the Memphis Listening Lab and follow us event updates on Facebook. Bill's Kiln, now on Mondays at midnight. WYXR 91.7 FM, Memphis. I'm listening. Get Real Talk on the TuneIn mobile app under WYXR, and he's now streaming live on Facebook. And you can also catch a rebroadcast on YouTube. Just put WYXR in the search box and hit subscribe. Now back to more Real Talk with Chip Washington. Talk. 
And welcome back to Real Talk Memphis on this Monday. I think I said it was August 22nd, but I think it's August 23rd. Uh, I'm not, is it, what's today? 22nd or 23rd? 23rd. Okay, all right. I'm sorry for messing that up at the top of the show. So listen, um, we have heard the stories. We have seen the videos. We have seen and, and heard from folks who deal with this COVID-19 issue on a daily basis. And I, I tell you right now, I salute each and every one of them for what they do and what they are sacrificing in their own lives. It's an exhausting uh, situation uh, to be a nurse in an emergency room setting. I'm very happy to have my first guest with us tonight. His name is Luke Parker, and Luke uh, is an ED nurse at Baptist Medical Center. And and Luke, uh, once again, man, thank you so much for taking some, some time to come on the show. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Chip. So, so okay, so um, obviously what you see is on a daily basis, uh, an hourly basis, a minute-by-minute minute basis is something many of us hear about and maybe see, you know, on TV some of the stories. But I want you to share with our listeners uh, kind of what you do and kind of what your day looks like, you know, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, typically I get here at six 30 in the morning. I uh, don't leave until seven o'clock at night, mm. full 12 hour shifts every day doing that typically three to four days a week. And this past couple of weeks, we've really noticed an uptick in the COVID patients, uh, especially with the Delta variant. We've seen a lot more of them. Um, and sadly, uh, a good majority of them have not been vaccinated mm. and are experiencing some worse symptoms than some of our vaccinated patients we're seeing. Um, but typically on a daily basis, I'll see anywhere from five to 15 COVID patients a day, uh, just myself. And then that's mixed in with your, your average patients as well. Um, it really goes it's on a day by day basis, but typically it's about four to five patients throughout the 12 hours and uh, just trying to do as much as you can for them. We're holding patients down here in the ER for extended periods of time. Yeah, yeah. But uh, doing the best we can to try and get them upstairs, keep them the the process rolling. Well, you know, um, I, I'm sorry. Look, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, you're good. I, 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 but you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago at uh, one of the uh, the briefings, Joint Task Force briefings, uh, Director Gina Swift from the Fire Department uh, was very clear about the fact that people using <laughs> Uh, ambulances uh, to go to the emergency room for COVID related issues, you know, are really need to try to figure out another way to do that because there are folks with other core morbidities, uh, other issues, health issues, serious health issues that can't get in the emergency room and can't get seen. Are you seeing a lot of that? We have seen a good bit of that. Um, it's it's a tough job as an EMT out there in the field, but a lot of them are having to make some game day decisions mm. of like, you know, this patient might be COVID positive, but they're a little bit younger, maybe not as many comorbidities. They're not as symptomatic um, and maybe trying to convince people that you might be able to fight this at home because we're, we're trying to clear up as much of the ER as we can for these patients that are really, really sick. We are speaking with uh, Luke Parker. He is an ED nurse at uh, Baptist uh, Medical Hospital. And, and uh, you know, Luke, as I, as I watch the stories, you know, not only f uh, from here, but for colleagues of yours across the country, talking about the sheer exhaustion that they feel, it just becomes overwhelming. Are there days that you feel that way as well? <laughs> You know, I, I tell a lot of people that I don't care what you do for a job, work is work. Um, and I, I think the same thing goes for me. There are certainly some days it's harder to get out of bed mm -hmm. than other days, mm -hmm. but I've grown to love it down here in the ER. I love the, the family I work with and the teamwork we have down here. I, I like coming to work most days here at Baptist. The, uh, you know, one, one of the, you know, one of the prevailing messages that we all hear uh, that is that this is a uh, this situation is really about the unvaccinated. Uh, most of the people that you see, I guess, on a daily basis are, are unvaccinated or I don't know if you can put a percentage on it. I mean, is that is it about maybe half and half or are most of them 
this because because I guess the phrase that is used is that this is the pandemic of the unvaccinated. And that's kind of what it's feeling like this second wave. Um, I've currently got six COVID positive patients on the side over on the ER mm. that uh, none of them have been vaccinated and all of them are symptomatic and feeling a lot worse than some of the unvaccinated patients. I was saying 50, 50 might be a little nice. Mm. I would say maybe 80, 20. Mm. Um, and if, if I can spread any message today, it would be, I encourage everybody who is not vaccinated to go get your vaccine, especially with the FDA approving, yeah. uh, Pfizer. Mm -hmm. I think that is fantastic news. And I'm hoping that we'll see an uptick in some vaccinations. When you, uh, let me stay on that for a minute. When you talk to some of the patients that you see, uh, on a daily basis, many of those unvaccinated, do you ever have a conversation with them about, you know, once you find out that they're not vaccinated or unvaccinated, why they didn't get vaccinated? or And are they starting to tell you now as they become symptomatic and get maybe getting a bit sicker that maybe that wasn't the wisest choice of not getting the shot? I, I sadly have heard from a few patients that um, have gotten a little bit too deep into the disease that I wish I'd gotten vaccinated. And yeah. um, I've... I've come to talk with a lot of patients that have told me it's either misinformation or fear of the vaccine. There's absolutely nothing to be afraid of with this vaccine. This is technology we've been using on vaccines for decades. Mm -hmm. This is trusted. The FDA is approving it. Um, but I, I try and, and convince them that it, it is as much as people want to say it's my body, my choice, you're you're able to spread this disease so easily that it really is not just about you. It's about the people that can't get vaccinated, the children that can't get vaccinated, the the populations that are much more at risk. You know. Yeah, there and, and there's and there's a lot of them, and, and quite honestly, in the, in a county of over nine hundred thousand people, there's still at least three hundred thousand folks stunningly to me that are not vaccinated for whatever reason uh th that seems to be the case now your hospital group along with uh, at least three others that i know of um, have all uh, also uh, decided that uh, all the the frontline workers employees need to be vaccinated uh, i take it you think that's a pretty good idea i love that idea the only thing i don't like about it is i, I hate that we have to do a mandate to make it happen but mm -hmm. Good point. That's the way the world works. Yeah. Um, I'm very happy to be around other people that believe in the same science I believe in and are backing up the vaccines that I'm trying to, to give out to people. I think that uh, many people are now wondering what the next step is in the process in terms of uh, now that there has been full FDA approval of Pfizer, uh, where other businesses, companies, corporations, academic institutions will start to enact a vaccine mandate before you come on their campus or in their businesses. What do you think about that? I think a lot of them are moving towards that um, just to try and protect the populations that are going to be on the campuses and things like that. Right. Um, I'm very for it. Uh, I have no issues getting a third vaccine if they told me I needed to go get it. Um, and to those people, I would say you went and got your MMR vaccine. You get the flu vaccine every year. There's no difference between this one. It's just as safe. It's just as helpful. Some of the younger uh, people that you see, and I think it's probably, I guess it would be safe to say 40 and under, maybe even 30 and under. Are you seeing a, a lot of, I mean, does it surprise you? Uh, the amount of, of young people say over the age of 18, but maybe under the age of 40 that are being admitted to hospitals these days because of COVID. It is a little shocking to me. Uh, the first wave, I did not notice the same amount of young people um, coming in right. as symptomatic as they are. Right. There was a couple patients I had a few days ago that were 26, 27 years old, and yes. you would not have been able to tell the way they were acting. Just very, very sick, very short of breath, struggling. Some of them are about to go on ventilators. It's it's tough times. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Uh, wrapping up with uh, Luke Parker, he is an ED nurse at Baptist Medical, and I really appreciate his time and 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 all your colleagues as well. I know fatigue is a big factor, and I also know that uh, being short staffed is difficult. Uh, how do you all function with that? Because I think everybody right now is functioning with a 
completely in sheer exhaustion and B, uh, that you need more help. Absolutely. We have uh, had the National Guard come down and assist us these past couple of days Mm -hmm. um, in just helping transport patients, uh, any ancillary help that we might need just to try and keep the movement in the department. That's been extremely helpful. And then every day before we start our shift, we kind of have a little um, powwow in the morning and just kind of talk about I know you're short staff. I know you're lacking nurses right now, but we got to pull together as a team and uh, work together to help get these patients the best care possible. Luke, before I let you go, um, please uh, give if you, you know, you, you uh, want to give you an opportunity to talk to the people out there who are skeptics and those who are unvaccinated as to why this is such an important uh, deal and why they should be be vaccinated. <laughs> I said it before and I'll say it again, uh, the, the patients that are refusing vaccines are not typically thinking of the populations that can't get vaccines. There are children, there are immunocompromised people who simply cannot handle being vaccinated. And those same people are uh, relying on us, the healthy ones, to go get vaccinated and create this umbrella of safety for all of us, but it only works if we all buy in. Luke Parker, ED Nurse, Baptist Medical uh, Group. Luke, thank you for everything that you do on a daily basis. Thank you for coming on the show tonight. And uh, I wish you, I wish you uh, health and I wish you strength and, uh, and keep doing what you're doing, man, because we sure need you. Thank you so much, Chip. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Well, that was, uh, that was a front up close and personal view of what goes on in these emergency rooms every day from someone who deals with this on a daily basis. Uh, Luke was very candid, and he he basically said, look, you know, if you don't get vaccinated, it doesn't just hurt you. I mean, there are ramifications far beyond you, so you should think about other things besides you when you're factoring in trying to make a decision. Excellent interview. Really appreciate that start. We're going to take another break, and when we come back, We're going to shift gears, but we're going to talk about an issue that a lot of folks uh, in Memphis and other parts of the country are facing having to do with eviction. This is Real Talk Memphis. I am Chip. You know who you are. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. You're listening to Real Talk with Chip Washington. If you're celebrating a birthday, anniversary, or special occasion, shoot him a note and he'll read it on the air. Get involved and tell somebody about Real Talk. We'll be right back. Hey everyone, this is Janet, host of Jaunt with Janet, Wednesdays from 4 to 6 p.m., bringing you new releases in the rock, pop, and electronic genres with a little bit of the old fused in, all here on WYXR Memphis 91.7 FM. Hey Memphis, my name is Ron Buck. I am looking forward to bringing you my show, Riverside, every Friday from 1 to 2 p.m. I will be playing rock and blues, old and new, and featuring Memphis music and events. I hope you'll tune in to Riverside every Friday at 1 p.m. on WYXR 91.7 FM, Raised by Sound. Jerry, your host of Without a Net, here on WYXR Sunday nights from 8 to 10. We're going to be hearing some pure jazz and some impure jazz and lots of other good music, too. Come join me this Sunday. See you later. Yo, what up, what up, what up? It is the president of Driven Type T, and you're now tuned in to Memphis's own WYXR 91.7 FM. The station with the city soul, man. Come on, you know what it is. Remember, never stop. Stay driven. Peace. Get 
Get Real Talk on the TuneIn mobile app under WYXR. And he's now streaming live on Facebook. And you can also catch a rebroadcast on YouTube. Just put WYXR in the search box and hit subscribe. Now back to more Real Talk with Chip Washington. And welcome back to Real Talk Memphis on this Monday evening. Chip Washington here. Very happy to have you with us and very happy to have my next guest with us. Of course, many of us are well aware uh, that the uh, poverty rate in Memphis is, is, is pretty high. And a lot of folks are struggling out there to try to make ends meet and try to take care of their bills and their families and their responsibilities. Of course, we all were aware of the eviction moratorium uh, that the federal government imposed. I believe that's about to end, and we're going to find out all about that and uh, some of the options that you can uh, explore in terms of trying to uh, take care of yourself and your family. Uh, my next guest is Karen Gauss. She is the program manager for the Division of Community Services for Shelby County. Karen, thank you for being with us. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Okay, now, did I mis- say your last name just so I can make sure I got it right. Is it Gase? Gauss? It's Goss. Goss, okay. I was, mm-hmm. look at that. Look at yeah, that. You were there. <laughs> Every now and again, I get lucky. Every now and again. Well, <laughs> well, listen, first of all, um, a lot to get to here. Um, talk to us about the eviction moratorium, uh, where uh, we stand with that, uh, and, and what comes next, and then we'll move forward from there. Yeah, so the eviction moratorium was actually put in place by the federal government and CDC, uh, basically putting a halt, you know, on evictions for uh, tenants all across the country. Mm -hmm. When we bring it closer to home, um, what some people don't realize is um, the eviction moratorium actually ended for West Tennessee being, i.e. Shelby County, right. um, back in April, um, actually March 31st, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and what that means is at that point, we no longer had protections. Tenants, residents here in Memphis and Shelby County no longer had protections under the eviction moratorium. Um, that's, and I'll explain really quick how that happened no, and well, the why well, behind well, that. Well, no, well, absolutely, because, I mean, for, for many people, that, that had to be a crippling blow, a, a truly crippling blow. So, so go ahead and explain how that happened, please. Absolutely. So to sum it up in its simplest form, what happened was a group of landlords rallied um, and went to, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Supreme Court judge of Tennessee mm-hmm. um, and basically stated that it was, unconstitutional for, you know, the CDC to put a halt order in place for landlords to not evict. Essentially, that judge ruled in the landlord's favor. And from there, we were no longer, i.e. residents, were no longer uh, protected under this national moratorium. So having said what you just said, how has that affected uh, what uh, you do? And more importantly, what our people who are struggling are facing on a daily basis. Yeah, so the effect of that one decision truly has been um, overwhelming for us. You know, Mm -hmm. we were at a point from the time of March until July 31st, we were at a point where our eviction courts, um, due to COVID, of course, you know, they were not fully up and running. Right, so right. only three courtrooms were operating. They only operated um, three days a week and they operated on a limited uh, docket. Okay. It helped the program a little um, when we talk about volume. Um, however, as of August 1st, you know, the courtrooms have opened up 100%. And so as we know, we have people who have been facing eviction since, you know, we'll say this time last year, mm-hmm. uh, and we know at that time last year, landlords could not evict, but now they can. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, landlords, I will say we do have some that have worked with us um, and are truly willing to give their tenants an opportunity. But we also have landlords who are like, hey, I've gone a whole year without payments. You know, I, I just want you all out. And at this point, the judges 
they they can't stop that. They have to move forward wow. um, with that eviction case. Wow, that's part of the process. Karen Goss is our guest. She is the program manager for the Division of Community Services for Shelby County. Okay, so so we so we we know where we are, and and but but and I also know that your uh, area, uh, the community services, off <clears throat> also uh, offers programs for individuals as well. Now. Over the weekend, I think Saturday, there was an event um, um, by the CSA, which is which is you all, uh, in terms of utility assistance in partnership with MLGW. Talk about that. Yes. So the Community Service Agency, uh, one of the departments within the Division of Community Services, I know that gets really confusing <laughs> for folks. <Okay. laughs> but yes, this past Saturday, they hosted a... Um, utility resource fair and i guess that's what i'll say for lack of better words um in which residents who were you know needed assistance with utilities and this was regardless of if you've been impacted by COVID or not if you needed help with your bill um they were able to come through the resource line we had staff on site who was able to check into their systems to see the is this person eligible uh, have they been served before? If they were eligible and we could serve them on spot, that tenant or that resident, not tenant, um, could then apply on site uh, for utility assistance. Um, it, it was a, a huge turnout. Yeah. Um, I think overall, uh, we we definitely accomplished what we set out to do, uh, which was getting the resource to the folks. And and I and I think because of that just uh, overwhelming turnout, um, it does really put a, a bigger spotlight on the need uh, that many people have in this community. Now, uh, talk about some of the programs uh, that people can apply for to help to get some financial assistance, not only for utilities but just for the day to days. Yeah. So. One of the things about the Division of Community Services specifically, um, and one of the things I like to refer to our division as, is we are truly the heart of government. Mm-hmm. Um, our division, we offer all types of services from rent and utility assistance to uh, age to services for folks who are in the aging community or disabilities. Uh, or has a disability, shall I say. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have Crime Victims Rape Crisis Center and even uh, Criminal Justice Services, uh, all for Shelby County residents, and all these services are free of charge. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we definitely have room and opportunity to serve people, um, and we have some resources. While I won't say they're not full scope, you know, all the resources we need because we can always use additional help but there there are opportunities for folks to be assisted i was going to say uh what what are some of the biggest challenges that you as an organization as a as a division face every day because it's not just one area or two areas it seems like there are several areas in life that people need help and assistance with so so what are your challenges on a daily basis yeah, so I, I think the biggest challenge is exactly what you said. You know, we come in contact with people who they may come to me for one specific thing. And just in one conversation, I've already identified three or four other yeah. uh, services that are needed. Yeah. You know, sometimes the challenge is just really because we know people are so complex. Their situations, their family circumstances are so complex. You know, sometimes it's just the timing of things. How quickly can we get things done? You know, uh, we also talk about a financial um, resource or the lack thereof, Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a lot of the programs that we run are grant-based. And so if anything changes in our funding, you know, with that grant, that really impacts the type of service that we deliver. Um, and then, you know, I could go on and on. We talk about personnel and staffing, you know, really beefing up personnel. So we do have the capacity to serve folks um, at a larger scale. So has that been a struggle for a you? Lot. 
Hey, Karen, has that been a struggle for you all in terms of staffing and, and having uh, the manpower and the resources to be able to do some of the things that you truly want to do in the community? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'll speak specifically um, on the ERA since that's the program that I do manage. Mm -hmm. You know, staffing has truly been a challenge. We have an excellent team in place. We have excellent partners who work with us. Uh, we did have to get very creative on how we disperse these funds and how we just administer the program. Um, but essentially, we always land in a position where the volume exceeds, you know, it's yeah. more than what we can actually do. Yeah, yeah. And so while our, inten our intentions are good, we want to get the resources to the folks. But sometimes we are limited by the capacity of what we can do as an organization. All right. So listen, um, having said all that, you've been very, uh, you know, forthright about the challenges that you as a as a as an organization face as a as a you know, as a as a division face. When people want information, help, assistance, financial or otherwise, please give them a way of contact uh, and how to find you and, and how to find the Division of Community Services. Absolutely. Um, so when we talk about just overall resources mm -hmm. um, that extend beyond rent or utility assistance, any, a resident can go to shelbycountytn.gov um, and look for Division of Community Services. We are right there on our web page. It lists all of our departments, the different services they provide, mm -hmm. uh, contact information. Um, and in some cases, depending on the department, there are applications available online in which a resident can go ahead and start completing that application right there. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the ERA programs go, um, that website is home901.org. Um, a resident who just wants to find out some information about the program um, can go on that site. Right now, the application is currently closed. Um, however, it's still a good source for other sure. resources that do the exact same thing that the ERA program does. Sure. Well, it, it sounds like, you know, that you're doing you're doing as much as you can to help so many people in need in our community. And uh, I applaud you uh, and Dorcas and all the rest of the folks there that, <laughs> that, that do it this on a daily basis. And of course, if there's any programs or any uh, thing that you are having coming up, like, you know, events or or something that the public needs to know, you know, in reference to what you all do on a daily basis and uh, some special events coming down the road. You're welcome back anytime. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you, Karen. Really appreciate you. All right. Bye. All right. All right bye bye. Karen Goss, ladies and gentlemen, program manager for the Division of Community Services for Shelby County. And listen. There's a great need here. You know, a lot of us, uh, you know, kind of walk through life, you know, kind of blind to to uh, what's going on around us. And there are a lot of challenges that people have who are around us. So we need to be a little bit more inclusive and a lot less exclusive when it comes to trying to help people. And this organization, and like I was alluding to over the weekend, Saturday, uh, MLGW um, had uh, it was a utility assistance program and some funds that they were dispersing. And I mean, to tell you, I, I saw video of crowds. I mean, People told people I heard people say that they were in line the night before at 10 o'clock for a 10 o'clock event the next day trying to be able to get a place in line so they could get assistance. That's a very big deal. And it's very telling as to what we are dealing with, you know, as we move along out here. Before I go to break, um, I want to ask you all something now. Uh, you know, we do this Facebook live thing and I know I ain't, you know, the best looking dude in the world, but. You know, the, the show the show does <laughs> provide some information that, you know, I think you guys should need or should want. And, you know, I would like a little more inclusivity in terms of this. You know, I mean, if y'all chime in and now I know I don't, you know, I don't I don't do the rap and the banter and a lot of the other conversations and things that you guys find interesting out here. But we're trying to do a little something, something with this show. So what is it you told me last week? People need to like to do. Like, follow. comment, share. And what was the last one? Follow. And follow. Like, comment, share, and follow. You hear that? Like, follow, share, and comment. comment. Right? Okay. 
Short-term memory loss. All right, we're going to take our final break. When we come back, we are going to talk to the newly minted president of the National Civil Rights Museum. His name is Russell Wigington, and I am Chip. You know who you are. You know where you are. And what's for dinner? We'll be right back. You're listening to Real Talk with Chip Washington. If you're celebrating a birthday, anniversary, or special occasion, shoot him a note and he'll read it on the air. Get involved and tell somebody about Real Talk. We'll be right back. Yo, what up, what up, what up? It is the president of Driven Type T, and you're now tuned in to Memphis' own WYXR 91.7 FM. The station with the city soul, man. Come on, you know what it is. <laughs> Remember, never stop. Stay driven. What you got in your record box? Bring it along to the Memphis Listening Lab and WYXR's inaugural record swap and zine fest, presented in association with Crosstown Arts. Vendors will be lining the halls of the Crosstown Concourse with rare musical finds and deep, engaging, independently published magazines. Hear live sets from WYXR DJs spinning the best from their final collections. The event starts at 10 a.m. Saturday, September 4th and Sunday, September 5th. For customer and vendor information, visit the Memphis Listening Lab and follow event updates on Facebook. Hey Memphis, my name is Ron Buck. I am looking forward to bringing you my show, Riverside, every Friday from 1 to 2 p.m. I will be playing rock and blues, old and new, and featuring Memphis music and events. I hope you'll tune in to Riverside every Friday at 1 p.m. on WYXR 91.7 FM, Raised by Sound. This is Janet, host of Jaunt with Janet, Wednesdays from 4 to 6 p.m., bringing you new releases in the rock, pop, and electronic genres with a little bit of the old fused in, all here on WYXR Memphis, 91.7 FM. Get Real Talk on the TuneIn mobile app under WYXR, and he's now streaming live on Facebook. And you can also catch a rebroadcast on YouTube. Just put WYXR in the search box and hit subscribe. Now back to more Real Talk with Chip Washington. And yeah, welcome back to Real Talk, man. We're having fun in between the, <laughs> the segments here. Adam is is one of the most talkative people in the entire universe. And, you know, it's like, you know, getting two words out of him is like we've, we've accomplished something here. Anyway, next week is his last week. I want to go to Facebook Live, and I see my good friend Ward Lindsay. And he said, hello, my friend. Thank you, Ward, for watching. Now, you know, we go to Full View Missionary Baptist Church in Bartlett, Tennessee, and there's a whole bunch of us people out there. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you try to recruit. You know what I'm saying? You, you recruit for us, man. You get some folks to watch it. Say, hey, you know, our church member Chip is doing this radio deal. So you should check it out. Anyway. And also, uh, I don't know where she went. She just left. Let's see here. There she is. Lily. Lily Faulkner Gilkey is watching. So, hey, Lily. Thank you for watching, paying attention. I really appreciate it. All right. So my next guest is, he's a really good guy by the way, and he is the new president of the National Civil Rights Museum. I'm sure you're all familiar with that facility. His name is Russell Wigington, and Russ, thank you for taking some time and sporting that bow tie. Man, you look good. Appreciate it, Chip. I'm glad to be here checking out checking out this wonderful show. Man, look, I, I, I appreciate you. So when you got the call or however it was you got notified that you were the president and the new president of the National Civil Rights Museum, uh, what went through you? How did you feel about all that? Man, it was a uh, wonderful call to receive, first of all. And 
Uh, I thought about a couple of things. I thought about the uh, sacred space that this place sits on mm -hmm. and thought about Dr. King and all he contributed to our world. Uh, I thought about this is in Memphis, Tennessee. We are the uh, location of a, of a place that if you were to uh, if you were to show a picture of room 306, most people in this country and many people in this world would would recognize it. And to have the opportunity uh, in, a, in a city that I love to lead this organization, just tremendous excitement and just humbled by humbled by uh, the opportunity. You um, obviously, uh, you know, have a have a vision um, of of what you would like to see the museum become, you know, in the future. And you're right; it's it's like a it's like hallowed ground. It really is uh, the the rain motel and and the, the history uh, that comes with that. Uh, so when you start to think about that, you know, on a on a on a daily basis, and as you start to move forward, you know, getting your feet wet and starting to uh, maybe, uh, you know, come up with the vision that you have for the future of the museum, where you want to take the museum, you know, what, is, what are the next steps in that process? Um, what do you see? Sure. A uh, couple things in particular. One is uh, I like to work collaboratively. So uh, there's a wonderful staff here that many of whom I already knew having served on the board mm -hmm. for many years. So I know the quality of the people here. And so I was uh, refreshed by knowing that we have people who uh, give deeply to this place uh, in, their, in their daily work and have expertise to contribute. A couple of things I've thought about in particular are building on some of its core strengths. It is such an important historical place. Mm -hmm. And you may know I'm, I'm trained uh, as a historian. Yes. I have a PhD in African American history yes. uh, and have um, and, and feel like that is part of who we are and the understanding and translation of our legacy our historical legacy to today is really important. So continuing to build on the good work that Beverly Robertson and Terry Freeman did in establishing that reputation. Mm -hmm. I think there's opportunity for us to lift that up on a national, uh, in a national way. Uh, as I talk to people around the country and in my previous roles, having relationships around the country, even though they recognize and know of the place, they don't know it as deeply as they can. Mm -hmm. And so part of what I want to do in collaboration with my colleagues is lift up the goodness of the place, identify where we can be distinctive, where we can be a go-to place uh, for the country and the world for issues related to civil and human rights, and to get the national philanthropic support that, that the museum deserves. So I'll be focusing on lifting our profile nationally and lifting our uh, philanthropic uh, coffers, if you will, or our financial coffers through philanthropy on a national basis. We are speaking with Russell Wigington. He is the new president of the National Civil Rights Museum here in Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, one of the premier events, uh, Russ, that you are going to be heading uh, this year is the Freedom Awards. And you talked about the international aspect, not just the national aspect of the museum, but the international aspect. And I think that it, they've done a wonderful job of incorporating all of that. So when you look at that on its face, the Freedom Awards, which is a wonderful ceremony, by the way, um, um, what do you see and, 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 and how do you see maybe improving that down the road? I think the Freedom Award is, is, is it's been in existence since our founding 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, this will be a really magical Freedom Award this year. It's celebrating uh, our 30th year as a museum and the 30th year of awarding the, of, of the Freedom Award. Um, uh, making sure that people not just uh, identify with the names of the recipients, but, but 
really understanding their contributions to society. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can be inspiring to be in company with uh, oftentimes famous people uh, and to be and to get words and to to, to hear more about them. Uh, but it's also uh, should be, I think, encouraging to all of us to give our very best mm -hmm. to make sure that human and civil rights are uh, applied to everyone uh, in this country and around the world. So it's a great opportunity for us to lift up who we are, to celebrate some special individuals. And the fact that, again, that it's in Memphis, Tennessee, for the light to shine on our amazing city in ways that uh, it doesn't, doesn't shine on enough. So it's an it's a, it's a evening of celebration all the way around. It, it, it really is. And you know, it, what you said a minute ago kind of brought to mind, we're, we're, we really live in a, in a, in a country that, that to my mind, there's a lot of turmoil. I mean, you know, we see, we see a lot of stuff every day that's, that's not positive, a lot of negative, uh, you know, a lot of folks killing each other. You know, we're killing each other off as a, as a, as a, as a race and as a civilization. Uh, and when, and when you see that, and put that in perspective, the National Civil Rights Museum in perspective of where we are as a society today, where does it fit and, and, and how much more can we, can we bring um, a positive you know, out of something that seems to be negative a lot of times? Right. I do think that uh, is part of our uh, national uplift. Uh, there's no reason why we can't be a go-to place in this country to understand yeah. and to uh, further the dialogue, conversation, and action around race relations, racial reconciliation, uh, and civility. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be um, uh, continue to be outspoken about uh, the the importance of civility and the importance of understanding others, mm -hmm. the importance of education uh, about people and about their culture and about their, their mores. Uh, so we have, we have a tremendous opportunity to be a place where the country turns to for, for leadership, and we will do that. Well, I, I tell you what, they got the right one. You, you've been, you've been, and you, and you're not afraid to say what you think, and you're not afraid to move forward with, uh, with object, with uh, uh, you know, in an objective way, in ways that are going to further uh, where we are uh, as a city. And I know that you are going to do wonderful things at the National Civil Rights Museum. Congratulations uh, on on being selected as the the, the new president. And uh, I look forward to you coming back on the show uh, to tell us about more things and, uh, that are, uh, that are going to be coming down the pike uh, as you continue to helm this organization. Thank you so much, Chip. We, uh, we, we, we couldn't get it done without the support of people in Memphis. Uh, we will be reaching out in some new and creative ways to Memphians to make them know this is their museum, while at the same time lifting up our national profile. I appreciate your support. Look forward to more conversation. Absolutely, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate you. All right. Take care. Uh, you too. Russell Wigington, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and again, he is the new president of the National Civil Rights Museum here in Memphis. And he's right. Uh, you know, we have a, an opportunity here to, to not only lift ourselves up as a city and as a community, but to be a beacon of light and hope um, even for the rest of the country um, because of the historical uh, reference that none of us will ever forget that when every time you walk past that Lorraine Motel, you know what that's all about. And if it doesn't do anything to you, it doesn't move you, doesn't make you feel a certain kind of way, then I don't know what to say about all that. But this has been a great show. And as Jack plays us out, I really appreciate all my guests tonight. Uh, Karen Goss, Luke Parker, and of course, Russell Wigington. And uh, it has been, uh, again, educational for me and i hope it has been for you and as we said earlier like support share comment about this huh follow up <laughs> you know <laughs> all those things that, that we talk about uh thank you so much for being with us tonight and uh, if you like what you heard uh and you enjoy the show tell somebody go out and tell somebody 
This is Real Talk Memphis for all of us here uh, at the big broadcast tonight. I'm Chip, and I'm out. <laughs>